introduction to our presenter. Uh, it's going to be started with uh, Eric Wolmers. Eric's one of our very active board members, and we're very appreciative of that, Eric. Thank you. Can everybody hear well enough today? Thanks, Bill, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm just going to do a, a little short intro, and then we're really good. When Bill asked me if I'd introduce today's guest speaker, Earl Harpham, I said absolutely and began to look forward to the opportunity. As I began to do some background work, police lingo, or research, um, I began to really see how much Merle had done and meant to our community in a lot of different facets. When I asked a close friend about Merle, he described him as being one of the most dependable, professional, respected statewide law enforcement officers we have ever had in Humboldt County. He coyly added, not everyone around here appreciates Merle, but they all have criminal records. <laughs> he continued to tell me that Merle had three careers, one as a beat officer, one as an investigator, and one as our chief of police. Merle never said no when being asked to help out. As I continued to look into Merle's career, I also realized that the best introduction should probably be made by someone whom Merle has known throughout his life. So, for a really proper introduction, I've asked Jerry Scott to say a few words on his behalf. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. In 1950, 1949, Humboldt State football did not win a game. <laughs> they lost every game. So in 1951, they brought down Phil Sarbo from Washington State, who had coached five years for the Washington State Cougars. And Sarbo brought down, with him the first year in 51, 21 high school boys, junior college boys from the state of Washington. In 1952, he brought down several players that you watched and read about, including Merle Harpin. Merle, a high school football player from uh, the state of Washington, came down in 1952. And he was a freshman in the fall of 52. And I was at Eureka High School. Tom Best, raise your hand, Tom. He was uh, a senior in 52. And Eureka had an undefeated football team. <laughs> Tom and I are the only two left, I think. <laughs> but Merle Harpum was playing football in Humboldt State, and he was also the chief photographer for the Times newspaper Sporting uh, News. And so Merle was on the sidelines taking pictures of the Eureka High teams in 52, 53, 54. Merle, of course, played football. Uh, at Humboldt, but he worked uh, as the assistant uh, sports editor at the Times Standard newspaper. And uh, he met a, a lady named Blanche, who was from Blue Lake. Blanche worked at the Times Standard newspaper. She was also a cheerleader at Humboldt State, and they were married in 1956. <laughs> they have four boys and one daughter, the daughter Kelly in Reading. A son, Ron, a detective here in the city of Eureka Police Department, and a son, uh, Rocky, a lieutenant with the police department in Anderson, Shasta County, California. Merle took his bachelor's degree at Sacramento State, a master's degree at the University of San Francisco, and came back to the Eureka Police Department in 1957. He served as a patrolman a sergeant, lieutenant, captain for uh, a total of 57 years. And he was also a police chief on three occasions as the interim chief, and the last occasion as the chief of police, city of Eureka. And uh, we, uh, the Historical Society has invited Merle to talk about his days in, in Eureka. And we thought we'd also uh, enjoy having Maggie Fleming, our district attorney, to make sure that Merle, uh, she worked with Merle for 18 years when Maggie was a deputy district attorney, and she'll verify the truth and authenticity of Merle's statements. <laughs> Merle also 
coached uh, Babe Ruth baseball, and he coached the Green Hornets in football, youth football, uh, probably for about 20 years, the Green Hornets and Babe Ruth. So it's with great pleasure that we have as a speaker Merle Harpham, the Chief Merle Harpham. Thank you. Uh, can you all hear me without this? No. 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 You can't? Okay. <laughs> I have a pretty strong voice. Okay, I'll try and remember to hold this up where you can hear me then. Uh, sounds like, uh, you know, uh, with the same department, 57 years, I've with the same woman for 50, over 50 years, lived in the same house for 50 years, so I guess I'm in a rut. <laughs> and, uh, but I've enjoyed my years here with the Eureka Police Department. I, people would ask me, when you, when are you going to retire? The day I wake up and don't feel like going to work, and that hasn't happened yet. How, however, it's not, you know, I had to eventually give it up, and it was tough keeping up with some of those kids out there. Uh, okay, <clears throat> one of the most interesting subjects, probably, uh, is prostitution. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, there's a saying that it's the oldest profession in the world, and that's true, and it was probably, you know, one of the oldest professions in Eureka. <laughs> it goes back to uh, the establishment of Eureka uh, in a, along about 1960. Uh, it started really growing here because, uh, you know, the, the gold that was discovered in the Trinities uh, and uh, a lot of miners were coming here. A lot of them didn't become miners. Uh, I mean, they became, they saw opportunity here in Eureka and became, uh, you know, building houses, construction workers uh, and logging. Uh, and so the, the area was full of men. You had loggers, you had mill workers, you had you know, people building all these buildings down here. Uh, you had the army here for uh, 12 years out at Fort Humble. And uh, in fact, they were the only law enforcement for about eight of those years that Eureka really had. They depended on them to uh, quell some of the problems that uh, existed. And uh, so naturally, with all these men here, uh, uh, it attracted prostitutes. So for 50, or for probably about almost 90 years, it was like, it's not there. <laughs> uh, it, it existed and not much was done about it because uh, they saw no need for it, basically. And so uh, there was an area in town that grew up as, they called it the Red Light District. And uh, it existed there for many years, clear up until 52, 53, right along in there. Uh, and very few women were arrested for acts of prostitution up until that time. Uh, I would go over the old booking books that we had. Uh, that's why, you know, book them, Daniel. Well, we had these great big huge books. And they were, still have them, still have them, piles of them, going back to the early 1900s. Beautiful handwriting these officers would have. They'd write in, you know, uh, the name of the person they were arresting, their age, place of birth, and what they were charged with. And they didn't have code. They didn't use codes, basically. It was, uh, you know, spitting on the sidewalk, failure to wear masks, uh, going north of fourth, uh, going north of fourth after, uh, after dark and things like that. And there was one there that kind of struck me as arrested for being a sporting woman. <laughs> so I went to an old time and I was asking, why, do, what, what's this spinning in the sidewalk, arresting people for that? And they explained why, and they were in favor to wear masks, that why certain people couldn't go north or forth. And so I said, sporting women, I mean, they had lots of prostitutes here and there's very few that are arrested for, for that. Well, it wasn't really considered a crime. It was more of a need here. And uh, I said, well, sporting women, aren't they prostitutes? Well, yeah, but that was a bad word. <laughs> Prostitute was, uh, you know, was like a dirty word because, you know, it would offend women and children. And uh, so they book him as being a sporting woman. So, 
anyhow, things went along like that for many years. And, uh, and of course, you know, World War II, we had a lot of soldiers here, uh, uh, sailors particularly. And uh, so uh, it was just, you know, everybody closed their eyes to it. It was a, a necessary evil, I guess, is the way it was looked at. And I said, well, why did they book some of these women for, for being sporting women? And uh, the old timers said, well, that, they screwed up. They messed, they went and robbed somebody. They <laughs> stole their John's wallet or something. And rather than charge them with the theft, you know, they didn't have prisons for women. Women didn't go to jail. And he said, rather than uh, charge them with theft, they charge them with being a sporting woman. And they pay their $10 fine or 15. And the man wouldn't have to testify. He wouldn't be embarrassed in the community because he got ripped off by a prostitute or was with one. So, uh, long about uh, early 50s, some of you may have remember Estes Kefauver, Senator Estes Kefauver from Tennessee. He started a crime commission investigation. And he went around to 22 cities in the United States investigating the mafia and uh, their uh, organized crime. And uh, he ended up, uh, in fact, I watched. Uh, he was in uh, uh, Tacoma, Washington. Of course, he got a big military base there, Fort Lewis. And I used to watch it at noon time when I was in high school. Uh, it was three or four of us that would, uh, one of our buddies lived right across the street from high school. We'd go there for lunch and we'd watch. Uh, fascinated. In fact, I found out later that it attracted more viewers <laughs> than I Love Lucy. <laughs> and so, anyhow, but they found, what he found out was that west of St. Louis, there wasn't much syndicated crime. It was all on the East Coast from St. Louis eastward. And out west, it hadn't developed yet. Uh, there was a case where it was like a mom and pop store. Uh, that's how they operated. And in Eureka, that's exactly what in the 30s and 40s. For instance, uh, there was, there, there, I heard some claims that there was as many as 30 houses. Now, I, I, when Harold Hammond, the district attorney, started closing them down in the early 50s, there were, I think, 19 identified. And uh, they were all centered around the Old Town area, what's called the Old Town area now. It wasn't called that in those days, of course. <laughs> it was the town. <laughs> and uh, they had a doctor uh, that would go around, at, and he had a little badge called uh, Rothel Inspector. <laughs> brass badge and uh, and he'd put that on when he'd go to these places so he could inspect the girls for diseases of course there's only two diseases that in those days that he worried about and they were both pretty curable with penicillin and uh, but he'd go uh, I had a, one old timer told me he'd go once a week I had another one tell me it was like every every other week twice, uh, twice a month and they'd inspect the girls and tell them a little bit about hygiene. One of the things, they had little pans of water in their room and with wash rags and they'd clean their, their john before they did anything. So uh, it was just, you know, it was an accepted way to be here. And it was that way throughout California for the most part. And so uh, after the Keefe offer uh, hearings and uh, they were, there was a, uh, one of the mafia guys bought a, a hotel in Reno, hotel casino, and so Edmund Brown, this, the attorney general, whose son is now, of course, our our mayor, I mean, our governor, <coughs> he called all the DAs together from all over the state and laid the law down. You need to go back and clean your town up because the mafia will come out here and then we'll have some real problems because they'll take over, they'll strong arm into these things, and uh, we don't want. Uh, the mafia uh, in charge of our problems out here. So uh, Harold Hammond was the DA then, and he came back. And before he could develop a plan, there was three three cops in the department. One was Sergeant Bob Whitey, very bright man, big husky, strong guy. But uh, we call him a geek today because he was very technical. And so. Him and a couple other officers, one was Zane Necross, some of you probably remember the Necross family here, and the other was Churchill. 
and uh, they started going and rounding up these girls, going to the and, and tell them you're going to go to jail. You got the choice of going to jail or leaving town. We'll take you down the Greyhound bus, and that's kind of what he did. He take they take them down, load them up in the police car, four or five at a time, and, and take their picture. We'll know you if you come back, and they'd send them south. And uh, well, then Harold Hammond moved into action and started red light abatements against these places. And I don't know how many he ended up getting total, but there was there was several. Well, what happens when you get a red light abatement? You close that building up, and it can't be used for one year. All the furniture is removed, the light fixtures, everything, and they board it up, and they can't use that building for one year. Well, the people that own these buildings. They cleaned up their own act. They saw that coming. They didn't want that to happen to them. And most of these are city fathers, uh, <laughs> some around the council, and uh, that rid of these buildings. And so, uh, it kind of by 1954, there wasn't any houses left in the region. Doesn't mean the prostitution stopped. <laughs> what happened? It, it was kind of. Uh, in a way, it was kind of bad because what happened was girls went to the bars and and streetwalkers, and uh, but it was still it was still uh, you know the women still in those days took pride of, of themselves and took care of themselves and they looked good and uh, I the more attractive you are the better business I guess you do <laughs> and so. Uh, there was even some, I ran into some situations where the girls were housewives. And they'd go out for one night, they needed to pay their gas bill or, or want a new dress or something, and they'd go out and, and go sit in the bar and pick a guy up. And so uh, that that became the, the way that the girls worked in those days, where either they'd walk the streets or they'd uh, go and sit in the bars. And then along came the earthquake of 54, of course, we know what happened there. The county courthouse was condemned as mm -hmm. city hall and a lot of other buildings. And so they tore the courthouse down and started rebuilding it. Well, they brought a lot of people in to work on this courthouse and the other buildings also that were condemned. And uh, from the Bay Area. And uh, so a lot of these people that came uh, saw Second Street. Second Street was a wild street. How many of you were in the 50s that were here, living here then? How many of you went down there and just, just watched the sights? <laughs> We'd go down there and there'd be a car sitting there with the windows down about this far ago, you know? People sitting there watching the sights. And, you know, we'd chase some guy out of a bar for something, fighting or whatever. And uh, they'd go, Psst, he went that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was, kind of, it was kind of interesting. Uh, going back a little bit to when I came down here in August of 52, I came down with a football player from San Jose State that was the captain of the football team. He was a linebacker. He was from my hometown. And he said, uh, 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 we've got to go down and look at the second street. I was in my frat down there. I had a friend from uh, Eureka. And he talked about this second street all the time. So I got to go see what the heck the second street is. Well, I had no idea. I was from a little town up in Washington. And, uh, and so we wandered down there one evening. And we're walking around. And it was like walking around the mall on Black Friday. And it was crowded. And so anyhow, we stopped. And there, I, there's a picture there someplace of the, of the fire at the, when the uh, Grand Hotel burned down. We, as we pass the Grand Hotel, there's an obvious uh, madam standing out front, and uh, and so, yeah, it would be right. Yeah, you can see Grand Hotel. Maybe some of see from there. Anyhow, there was a madam standing on the doorway there, and so my friend, being four years older than me, was kind of, uh, you know, I, I was kind of shocked by it all. And he approached her and started talking to her, and she said, get the hell out of here. Don't you see the cops over here? The heat's on. Come back later. <laughs> and so and that was my first realization of the father. Some, 
weird stuff going on here. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, it was all confirmed then when I went up, it came on the police department. But uh, the girls uh, did not, were not allowed to drink in, in the 30s and 40s. They were not allowed to uh, consume alcohol or drugs, which was nowhere, of course, in those days. Maybe in marijuana once in a while, or a rumor of marijuana. And uh, so now, the 60s come along, uh, or, or actually, uh, you know, the late 50s come along, and we've got these girls working, and we've got, now we're having problems. We're having pickpockets. We're having girls taking guys to a room, and their boyfriend would jump out of the closet and put the strong arm on him and steal his wallet. And, and of course, the guys didn't want to complain. They'd want to tell us about it, but they didn't want any us to do anything, because they didn't want, you know, to get out of it. Uh, what they were doing. Tell you a funny story. Well, one of the uh, tricks also was for the girl to get the guy in the uh, uh, bed and say, "Okay, I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'll be right out. Uh, and uh, get ready for me. I'm going to go freshen up." And she'd come out and grab all his clothes or his wallet. Anyhow, in some cases, only grab the money and ran and run. Or we had one case where. Uh, they threw the, the money out the window and then went around and, and got it. But uh, funny story on one of them. One night my partner and I would get a call to go to a motel to meet a guy there. He wants a civil standby. So okay, so we go there and we're told what room to go in. And here's this guy sitting on the bed with no clothes on except a sheet. He's got a sheet wrapped around. Him. And we're, what's going on? He says, "Well, I picked up a girl." and brought her to this hotel, motel, and he says, and uh, she told me to get ready for her, and she was gonna go in and get ready herself in the bathroom, and she'd be right out. She came out, all my clothes were on a pile on a chair. She scooped them up, and out the door she went. And he says, okay, and so what do you want me to do about it? <laughs> well, I need to stand by because I've called my wife. <laughs> <laughs> because I, she had told her to bring me a set of car keys and a set of clothes. <laughs> she got, got a car key also. And I want somebody to stand by because she's going to kill me. <laughs> so the wife showed up, and the whole time he's dressing, she's just glaring at him. Oh, she is mad. And uh, he was a businessman from uh, another town south of here. And, uh, the last we heard was she now owns, owns the business. <laughs> so, anyhow, so that was that became a problem. Then as we move on, uh, and at the same time uh, we were working with the ABC, the, there was too heavy of a concentration of bars in the same area. So we worked with the ABC and they we'd, we'd uh, work at getting them closed and moving the license to another place. Because they're only allowed so many licenses apparently for the county, and so we started moving the license around to other parts of town or even out of town, and which started closing up 2nd Street. Uh, so what happened was a lot of these people that came to work on the courthouse went in and opened them as coffee shops, which ABC could have no control over because they didn't have a license. So uh, the, the, the joke was, was that there was selling more liquor in there than <laughs> than when there were bars. <laughs> and uh, so what you do, that's where the girls went. And so what you do, you'd go in and order a drink, and the bartender would say, no, all, all I can say, I can sell you a Coke for 50 cents. And see that guy sitting over in the corner, and there'd be an old gentleman sitting over there. Go over and tell him what you want. So he'd go over there, and he'd open his coat, and you'd take your pick of what you wanted, <laughs> whiskey, vodka, whatever. Paying three dollars, and he was. We found out he was buying them out of the country club market for a case for a dollar seventy, dollar fifty six a case, and he was selling each bottle for, for uh, uh, three dollars. So he was making pretty good profit. And so the girls started hanging out in these places after the bars had closed, and other around there and other parts of town, and the girls would hang out there to uh, pick up their jobs. And so, uh, consequently. We started uh, working those places in 1968. Uh, I had just become a sergeant, and I was a sergeant, and, and, and for two days a week, I 
my job was to deal with vice bomb in Riga. The other four days, I was relieving another sergeant. I was called a relief sergeant, so that they could have the days off. So uh, I started working on a place called the Rainbow Club. It had been a bar, and it changed into a, a coffee house, and that's where all the girls. Are. So I got. I got officers from all over the county, sheriff's office, Ferndale PD, Fortuna PD, Arcata. I got all these uh, different officers and, and some of ours to go in and the girls would solicit them and we, they'd describe who they were, they'd find out who they were. We were, we'd, we'd get in a building across the street with the doctor and, and watch till we'd know who the girls were and they'd give us a signal, we'd have some signal rigged up. And so we'd know the girls. So between uh, January 8th and October, and the reason I remember that was because after my mother-in-law came to live with us. <laughs> I need an excuse to stay away from the house. <laughs> so the working place, I arrested 67 different women out of that rainbow club. And, uh, and of course the rules had changed somewhat. It was much harder to get in a red light abatement then than it was for Harold Hammond in, in uh, in uh, the early 50s. But I ended up successfully convincing the DA to go with the red light abatement. We closed the Rainbow Club up, boarded it up, and it stayed closed for one year, never opened again as a bar. Of course, it opened as a hardware store. <laughs> it was right down there across from the high Uh And so uh, the, 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 the girls, a lot of the girls were passing through. Prostitutes, got to where they would make a circuit. They'd work San Francisco, Oakland, Eureka on their way to Portland and Seattle and they'd make a circuit. And uh, they loved to stop in Eureka for a layover because it was uh, $20. Here, we're in San Francisco, they'd only get $10. So Eureka was kind of a favorite stopping point. And so we had a lot of transient prostitutes up and down with their pimps coming to town. Uh, I got to tell this story because it was kind of funny. One night we had a couple of uh, business guys, friends. Uh, one was a one owned a restaurant, and the other owned part owner of a, uh, a bowling alley. And we got them to go down, pose as lumber buyers, and flash a little money around. And uh, they got hit on by these girls, and uh, we ended up arresting the girls. And their pimps came in to try to get them out and said, sorry, they've got to stay in jail. It was like a Friday night. They've got to stay in jail till Monday. And then Monday morning, we take them to the health department for their VD tests. Mm -hmm. And it takes, they take cultures and it takes 72 hours for the cultures to develop. So they're going to be here until next Wednesday. Well, these two pimps that came in, I mean, they were feather in their hair and suits that lit in the dark and glow in the dark. And, and uh, so they, you know, they, they brought the girls to town to work and then they uh, uh, do patty scams and stuff around town, gamble. So we uh, had them in jail and they were going to be there until at least the next Wednesday. So these guys decided to go back to the Bay Area. So they get in their Cadillac and they head south. Well, they get down to around Ukiah and they're driving through town and they see a, a clothing store there. And, and this is a little hip town. They probably don't even have a cop on duty. Uh, it's more burglary here. And so they break a window out, it sets the alarm off. They go in and they scoop up suits of men's clothing. Nothing that they would wear because they weren't bright enough. But they stuff them in garbage, uh, garbage cans and go truck them down the street with them. Well, and the, the people in Ukiah hadn't realized that what you have to do is you put the coat hangers, you alternate the coat hangers so somebody can't oh. take a whole bunch at one time. Oh and so they take a whole. Anyhow, uh, I talked to uh, uh, one of the officers in Ukiah called me and told me about they had these guys in jail and they said they'd just come from Eureka and the girls are up there and yeah, that's right, they're here. <laughs> and uh, I says, uh, you have any problem? No, hell, they were easy to catch. It's hard to run with high heels on with goldfish swimming around in your heel. <laughs> so uh, those are those are strange times. And uh, so anyhow, they uh, then along came a, another issue. 
hepatitis A through Z. <laughs> we never dealt with that before. In fact, more people are dying from, I forget which one it is, it's one of the hepatitis. More people are dying from that than AIDS. But then uh, AIDS also yeah, came along. So, and the girls, of course, aren't being tested now. And we couldn't, we used to try to uh, get warrants for them and whatnot and pick them up on a Friday night so they'd have to stay in jail until the following Wednesday. So, uh, and uh, so a group called Coyote, Coyotes, there was a prostitution uh, activist group from the Bay Area that took everybody to court, because everybody was doing the same thing. And uh, took went to court, and the Coyote was, it stood for Call off your old tired ethics, <laughs> and uh, and so they took us to court and they won. That we couldn't do that anymore. They had to be released uh, on bail or 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 whatever. Uh, couldn't couldn't do the VD checks on them anymore. So you know that kind of became a problem uh, with the, the, the diseases that were uh, out there. <coughs> and you know it went on. We still have prostitutes today here. And it went on until meth came along. Meth came along and it was a whole new ballgame. Uh, I mean, before some of the girls were on heroin, but they still took care of themselves. Uh, meth, they'd wake up, scars in their face, teeth missing, you know, falling out from the meth, and, and they'd put on old dirty clothes and go out, and I don't know how they ever made it. but. They'd be able to get tricks. Uh, how, I don't know. Uh, so anyhow, uh, that, 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 that is still a problem today. Other than we do have now something called internet. <laughs> and for a while, uh, it was, I don't know what, well, what's happening now with it, but I know for a while it was Craigslist. You can go on Craigslist put in the area you want to look at. I mean, you want to look at girls in San Francisco, you want to look at girls in Seattle, wherever, uh, or Eureka. I don't know. They put in Humboldt, and, and all these girls would come up. And of course, usually, we worked a few of them, and usually, uh, the pictures that they put on there were not. They were from something else, I don't know. From, uh, uh, what's the name of that lingerie outfit? That, Victoria, 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 yeah, <laughs> they were, you know, like girls out of Victoria's models, you know, and it wasn't really what you'd end up getting, because we, we did arrest a few, we had a motel, a couple of motels here in town that cooperated with us, and we'd set up in, in the next room, and, uh, and so, uh, when the girls would come there and we'd arrest them, why, uh, they didn't look like anything like the pictures that they, they put on, on, the, on the internet. Uh, and that was to show you the attitude of people. Uh, it was like it was like this. What we had to do originally in the early '50s, uh, after they closed the houses, what we would have to do is we'd have to send a John out, an undercover officer or whatever, and he could not approach the woman. That would be entrapment. He had the woman had to approach him, and then he. Uh, she'd say, I'm, you know, I'm a working girl, or are you looking for a date? That was the usual line. Uh, are you looking for a date? <laughs> and then you could get in a conversation with her, and you had to get t two things established. Actually, three. Two main things with the conversation. One was it had to be uh, act of sex for money. And then you had to have a continuance of the thing. Uh, so, so what we'd have to do is we'd have we'd have the John take her to a motel, and that would show up, and, and once they got him in the room, they'd give him the money, it was usually marked money, and they'd get him in some state of undress, and we'd come in and take photographs of him in this state of undress, and, uh, and we'd have to take the marked money off of him. And uh, in fact, I didn't introduce my friend here with me, uh, Renee Mader sitting over here. She worked with our department for uh, 30 years, uh, worked for me, and she went with us on a lot of these things. And for years, uh, she's here today to keep me from saying something pretty good and correct. <laughs> I'm far enough away from her that she can't take it. But uh, one of the things that for years, you know, we'd, we'd bring the girl in and, and turn her over to her to search. And search her good? Oh, yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Well, it wasn't until after she retired I found out she never searched any of them. She'd take them up to the matron at the sheriff's office and they would search them for her. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Well, she, she did not want to touch those <laughs> girls. Good and, for you. you know, so anyhow, uh, so that's how we had to do it. And then uh, as the diseases became very popular, uh, that was a lesson to where all we had to do was get a solicitation. Solicitation for sex form or meet me uh, at such a the motel parking lot. And they'd go, they'd go there and our office would be waiting there to arrest them. And that would show the continuum to the act. Well, to show you the difference in how people felt about prostitution, if we had a guy standing in the corner, and this is, I mean, if we had a woman standing in the corner that was a known prostitute, we arrested her 10 times, we could not approach her. She had to approach the officer. And so, but if we had a man standing in the corner, and he was, uh, uh, suspected drug dealer, but we don't we didn't know. We could have an officer go up to him and say, "Hey, you got any good stuff?" Yeah, yeah I got some hair. I can sell you. Bingo! You can arrest him. It wasn't entrapment. <laughs> so it was kind of different uh, when it came to the prostitution. We, we had to go through all these different steps in order to establish the probable cause for the arrest. Uh, I should have made some notes, but I kind of thought I, I could probably just talk about this. So, <laughs> so uh, you got a bell here? You want to ring it when I've when I've gone too far? <laughs> oh, <this is> good. <laughs> Anyhow, so we uh, we started doing situations where we we uh, as I say we get them identified and then get a warrant for them. And try to have a bunch of officers go out and round them all up on a Friday night so that. You know, they'd have to stay in jail. Well, Coyote, the group Coyote, uh, kind of killed that for us. So, but uh, we still would try to get them on the weekend at least. Uh, but we might, the solicitation might have occurred like on a Tuesday night. And, uh, you know, when they started closing up, when those three officers went out, there was other officers involved. Those were, those were the three that got identified as being the culprits. And so they ended up getting fired. But they didn't fire them for closing up the houses. What they fired them for was trying to bring civil service to Eureka Police Department. <laughs> Which, I mean, occurred anyhow, but, but they used that as an excuse because uh, they wanted to teach them a lesson, I guess, that they shouldn't have messed with the girls. Uh, anyhow, uh, am I forgetting anything I thought we ought to talk about? Uh, uh, Anybody got any question they want to throw at me? Sure. Huh? I'm interested in some of the some of the photos. Uh, yeah. That you brought that you could maybe identify some of those places. Okay. Sure. Uh, you want to? There's Whitey's Club. Okay. That was the second scene. It later became. Okay. The next slide to show what it became. Became the Ebony Club. How ironic is that? <laughs> and then it became Charlotte's, uh -huh. and uh, and then after now it's uh, a uh, uh, Chipotle's. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then on up the street, you see the Cecilia's Cafe. Mm -hmm. There was a, a girls working out upstairs there, and then the Fairwinds on down the street. <laughs> the Fairwinds Bar, uh -huh. yeah. and. Uh, and then on up was Jim Dunn's on the corner there. And Jim Dunn's was probably, it stayed a bar for a long time after a lot of the other places had moved out. Uh, and, uh, I, and I don't, I, you know, I don't know why other than they did have to leave a certain amount of them down there. And, uh, and so there are, some, there are some still bars in the area. But uh, the high lead, let's see if we can show some of them. Uh, there is the fire at the corner, at the Grand, Grand Hotel there. I talked about, uh, that's my yeah. first contact with the man. It was right there at that Grand Hotel. One of the cafes oh. next. Next to that was the Transient Hotel. Oh. They all had places up there. On the corner was a newsstand fountain. I'll go in there and get a hot dog or, oh, yeah. remember that one? Yeah. yeah. Mission Ice Cream. Yes, right, Mission Ice Cream. <laughs> And, uh, and then that block burned and became, uh, I think we have another picture of the, 
that, that, that's the block there. You see that all vacant just after the fire. In the foreground here, it was called the Lighthouse of something Faith at the time this picture was taken. This is right across from the Park Museum. And that little building there was the yellow cab stand. Yeah, that was the yellow, originally the yellow cab stand. We had a lot of cab companies in town in those days. You know, the yellow cab, the black and white, the Henderson Center cab, and there's one other one. I forget what it was. Uh, anyhow, because a lot of people traveled in cabs in those days. And now I think there's only one cab company. Uh, and so now that is the police annex. Our old town officer works on that building. He's got a computer in there and a radio, telephone, and, uh, uh, and he works out of that building. But it uh, became a sandwich shop, a little, a little I don't know, what, what's it called? A lighthouse cafe, was it? Yeah. The lighthouse. The lighthouse. Yeah, the lighthouse. Anyhow, uh, so, but across the street, you can see the back of all the, the bars there. You can see they kind of look kind of ugly, actually. The, uh, yeah, yeah. But some of them, when I came on, had iron doors, big, huge iron doors on them, uh, strapped. You could, you could not get in them. And that was to keep, that was, uh, they were put in there during the prohibition. And we had a woman mayor by that time, the name of Emily Jones, great lady. She was the mayor and uh, during prohibition. And so she'd go with Chief George Littlefield with her little hatchet, <laughs> and they'd go into these. Uh, places and bust up their liquor. Uh, the high lead had a balcony that above the bar area, uh -huh. and it took a long time to get up there. But uh, they had each little cubby hole with a, a table for about four people or six people, and curtains go in there and be very private mm. and do your drinking in there. And it was all around horseshoe shaped around the top of the high lead, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there was a lot, of, a lot of history down there. A lot of, we used to have a lot of fights down there in uh, Old Town. We didn't, as I said, we didn't call it that many days. Uh, but, you know, it was at different times. Uh, they, they fought fair. You know, two loggers or a logger and a fisherman would go at it, and they fought fair. And the weapons didn't come out. Uh, once in a while, we'd arrest some guy for kicking somebody when he was down with his logging boots on. That was a felon. Kicked somebody in the town. But other than that, they, Queensberry rules, you know, they, they toe to toe and fight it out and, and then go have a beer together. Uh, no weapons. So, until 1960, we started seeing that problem when uh, these places became coffee houses. But uh, prior to that, uh, I think uh, Mrs. Scott there pointed out, she saw one of the things there, pointed out that. Uh, uh, a, a year history of what was uh, arrest, arrest reports. And she said, murder, zero. Yeah. That's the way it was. We had very few homicides in those days. Uh, uh, it was, I remember one year, Chief Shipley, some of you probably remember mm -hmm. Chief Shipley. We were at a staff meeting one morning, and uh, on December 31st, and we're talking about, he said, and Shipley says, God, we're lucky. We didn't have a homicide this year. Well, 15 minutes to midnight, <laughs> we had a homicide out the Vista Del Mar, <laughs> uh, which some of you probably remember was at uh, First and uh, C, or Commercial Navy. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, so man, did we give him a bad time when we next meet, met, met him. He jinxed us. And because uh, it, it took a lot of manpower to, to investigate a homicide. But uh, now, I think we've had five this year. And uh, we, uh, but there were times there where we didn't have any homicides. There were times when we had very few fatalities in town. Uh, and uh, it would be like, uh, for the whole county, remember uh, when you're seeing figures for 52 De accidental deaths in Humboldt County. Most of them were outside the city. There were only very few. And we'd get award, uh, awards from the state. Uh, Lieutenant Pete Persissi, maybe some of you remember oh, yeah. Pete Persissi. Yeah. He'd be very proud of those little packs he'd get from the state that we didn't have any pedestrians killed. <laughs> well, they don't happen anymore. Uh, yeah. 
we have that issue on Broadway with people yeah. going from their campsite to their wherever they bought their beer from and crossing the street in the middle of the street without crosswalks and so and they make mistakes. Uh, so anyhow, uh, anyhow, did that answer? That was great. <laughs> any other, Some, any other somebody was wondering where the highly oh yeah show, show that one. But it should be right there. Uh, in fact, that whole block, that used to be, that there were seven bars in that one block between, uh, on 2nd Street between E and F. There were seven bars that went seven nights a week. And uh, and there's a high lead. And uh, down there, that yeah. White East Cafe, that became a coffee. That was a bar before that. And then you had the LaSalle bar. And the lumberjack bar, the cell bar was owned by a guy named Evangelinos. I don't know if any, maybe some of you knew Don Evangelinos, his son. Uh, his dad owned that bar. And had some interesting stories there. Texas Hotel was upstairs, of course, and that was another place in the group worked on it. But you can see the face of it up there at the top and now how it looks today. None of those are bars. <laughs> and so there was, se in that one block, there was seven seven bars with live music seven nights a week across the street you had the mm -hmm. rainbow club oscars pride of humboldt uh and then one other one and then around the corner of course you had cecilia's cafe and the mecca rooms which was also and around the corner the other way was the fan club so i mean probably remember that was one of the nicer places i mean uh, yeah. people from uptown eureka would go to that place in the bands but uh, uh the decent people did not uh, venture on the uh, other part of Second Street there, where all the fights and everything occurred. Yeah. <laughs> you were you were talking about what was in the uh, the booking. Um, right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Just out of curiosity, why couldn't people go past Fourth Street? Well, it was your. Uh, that's what I asked one of the old timers. Says, well, he says, look at where they're from. Germany. He says this was during the war. They could not go north of Fort because they were afraid of, and the Italian, they were afraid, and there were a lot of Italians, they were afraid of, of a sabotage. Oh. And uh, because other cities had, their their ports had been uh, blown up by uh, saboteurs, and you know, uh, and so uh, they were outlawed. There was a while where they couldn't go north of Fort after dark, and then it became they couldn't go north of Fort at all. And so, uh, you know, that was something that was politically correct in those days. It would not be politically correct. Yet. But you're looking at those old books, well, very few people were born in the United States. You're looking at the ones in like 1950, very few people were born in the United States. They were born in Germany. Most of them were from Europe. And uh, so, uh, it's, it's, uh, the same thing happened in, in, uh, during World War II, where they rounded up all the Japanese and put them in, in camps. You know, I, I, in fact, I went to college and played football. Hank Yamagata, remember Hank Yamagata? Played football with him, and he had spent his childhood in a camp up at Alturas. And so I, I always think back and say, why just the Japanese? We were working with Germany, too. So, uh, <laughs> they've been very difficult to identify by then, uh, all the people. Yes? Why couldn't they spit in the street? Well, there was three reasons why. Spread the disease. Some of the streets were made of wood, redwood, and they got slick. And then also the women wore long dresses and it was drag in that. So that was against the law. I mean, there were some weird things on the books. Uh, the masks. Uh, they probably read some more for dri driving a spike into a saw log. That was a felony. That was very serious to drive a spike into a saw log. And go to a mill. Just, yeah, because it was like, and then teeth would come off there like honey two bullets. What about the masks? What? Oh, failure to wear the mask, that was, uh, that, of course I asked that, and I said, well, that was during the flu epidemic. And Eureka was hit pretty hard with that. Uh, I don't know if you remember, I mean, there was a lot of young soldiers going to war that contracted the, uh, that influenza and died en route to their, their, their bases. Uh, they all had to go uh, east, mm -hmm. you know, everything was east. And, and so a lot of 
young people. Uh, I saw the names of some of them. I recognize the names of some of them that had passed away on the train, even uh, en route to war, because of the. There was one place in your in Arcata that uh, they didn't have this problem. The guy, the guy that owned the, the Arcata Barrel Factory locked everybody in, provided for them, brought in their meal, um, took care of them, but he wouldn't let them leave the premises. And nobody that worked for the barrel company got the influenza. At least they, they, they didn't die from it. So that was the reason why favorite wore the mask. So you had to wear a mask. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Are there any ethnic group more represented in the um, among the constituents? More what now? Uh, an ethnic group. Well, it was predominantly white until 1960 or 1958. It's predominantly all white. Behind the um, uh, Veterans Resource Center on 4th Avenue, there's three small buildings attached that are historical sites. And I was told that that's where some of the prostitutes um, lived or met with the men they were service. Yeah, well, Do you I, know about those and what went on? The only one I know on 4th Street was the Triangle Motel. That's the only one I'm familiar with. We arrested a lot of prostitutes out of there. And uh, mm. a, a, some a woman, I forget how it went down, but some woman uh, filed a complaint, and I, I don't know if it was a red light of vacant. I don't think it was, but it was somewhere, anyhow, we, oh, I know, the guy that wanted to condemn the building, and the owner of the building was afraid of the people that were living there, because they were criminals and pimps and whatnot, and so he said, please do. <laughs> so it was kind of his permission that we were able to condemn that building and tear it down. And that, we had that picture up here a while ago, I know. Okay, that was an interesting thing. I should have covered that. Uh, because of the coyotes action, that was one of the things they said. You're arresting only women. The men are part of the problem. Well, it was very difficult to get the men in those days because we had to send the female out to get propositioned by a, uh, by a man and go with him to some location. And we didn't want her, our women to do that. So, but what happened was when, the, when they um, changed the probable cause, we were able to send women out, and we started doing that, and they didn't have to go with the man. They could hear the conversation. We'd record it on our recorders, and then we'd arrest them. Hmm. And, and again, it was the case for them. Uh, they, had to, they had to do the, the talking. I mean, the, our undercover officer, female officer, did not. Uh, solicit the man. He had to solicit her. And so uh, we put her out in an obvious place on 3rd Street around the Ritz Club. Later on it was up around the library. <laughs> and uh, we put the guy, uh, we put her up uh, in that area walking or just sitting in the car and then she'd get, when she got approached we'd record the conversation where the guy would offer her money for sex and we moved in and arrested her. Hmm. But we did not, uh, you know, prior to that it was very difficult to expect a woman to go to the motel with a guy and get him in some state of undress. Mm. <laughs> what change? Oh, it changed. It started changing in the uh, late sixties. Mm. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. So along that line, um, when you told the story of the guy who called you to do a standby because right. he had called his wife, right? And so that would have been an opportunity. To arrest him, but at that time you oh, did not even think about it. Oh, yeah, it was so, no, I mean, he, he, he was, was going to suffer more. <laughs> 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 but, 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 but,
Yeah, yeah, we, we wouldn't yeah. have arrested yeah. them regardless. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, if not, I'll... Over here. Oh, oh, here. We've got one. Where? Oh. What about the pimps? Were they ever arrested? Yeah, they're very hard to get. Uh, they would usually transport the women. Uh, they were so, they were disgusting to me because they should have bandaged these women. Uh, we had one come out from New York and had five girls working for him. And uh, he, he bragged about having this stick. It was like a square stick about uh, yay long. He bragged about keeping them in line with that stick. Mm. And uh, in fact, Renee, my partner over there, would spend a lot of time with these girls trying to convince him. These guys are taking advantage, not the Johns. These pimps are taking advantage of you and are using you. And uh, they, because they've got the money, and if they didn't turn all the money in, they got whacked on, they got thumped. And uh, and so the, the gals, I, I felt very sorry for them until meth came along, and then I, I'm not much hope for them. But prior to that, I felt very sorry for the women, and, and I did the same thing she did, try to convince them, you know, you're leading the wrong life if you're making some wrong decisions. And, uh, and so, uh, very few of them. Once in a while, we get one that goes straight. I had one come in after I arrested her and thanked me because she said, I've seen the light. Uh, only one. Now, I think Renee had one also that came in later and, and thanked her for uh, setting her on a new path. But uh, yeah, it was, it was very disgusting, these, these pits. I hope. I love to arrest them when you could, but it was very tough to get them because uh, they sit up, up the street in the car. And you couldn't develop probable cause of why why they're there, and, but you knew why they were there. They were there to protect their their interest, so to speak. Okay. And then, uh, and, and that, that brings up, you know, that was one of the questions I asked some of the old timers. I said, was was the cops in those old days on the tape? Were they getting things? No, hell, it was legal. Why? How are you going to get them? <laughs> no. So, uh, and it, it's kind of a wonder because they. You know, in uh, uh, 1887, the city council had a meeting and they developed Ordinance 110, which directed the rules that the cops had to live by, which were, do not visit any bar, except on duty, no brawny house, except on duty, no house of ill repute, except on duty, no circus, no carnival, or any place of amusement. What, we give you one day off a month? <laughs> when I started, we had the, I started at 385 a month and worked six days a week. And as a result of me being hired for all the two other guys, they were able to move to five and a half days for a while and we ended up going to five days a week. So uh, it's a wonder, you know, that it's, we all had second jobs. <laughs> you know, we worked at some of the mills. Uh, I drove part-time for Burnt Brinks so their driver could have a day off. Uh, did, you know, different things like that. Pulled green chain out at Break Hut, loaded boxcars out of Break Hut, filled fish boxes uh, mm. out at, on Friendly's Road. So, and uh, our wives didn't work. There were very few of the wives who mine did. Uh, mine was a newspaper reporter for the Standard. That's back in the days when it was the Times and the Standard, not Times Standard. They were owned by the same guy, Donald Kane, but uh, we had different editorial staffs. They used the same printing presses mm -hmm. and same editorial or same uh, uh, advertising staff, but the, uh, the uh, editorial staff uh, were totally different. Standard came out in the afternoon, the Times came out in the morning. I used to sit in this that little building that I showed you where the police annex is now. Mm -hmm. I used to sit in there with the boss, Elmer, Hed uh, Elmer Hodgkinson, was my editor, and I'd go with him and sit in that little shack with the dispatcher from the Yellow Cab Company and wait for the first page to come off the press, which was across the street. And we'd get the first page. In fact, one of the guys from the printer shop over there would bring, the, bring us the first page, and we'd go over and check for any mistakes. <laughs> and we didn't worry about the rest of the paper, but uh, Elmer Hodgkin was a sticker on spelling and punctuation and stuff like that. So he uh, 
So we sit there and read the first page of the paper, make sure uh, we weren't putting something out that was uh, so that we were illiterate or something. <laughs> and Emily Jones, of course, was proofreader uh, also, so she proofread it before it went actually went to type. Mm -hmm. And as I say, she was oh, mayor of the museum one time. Uh, Great lady. Yes. During, I know this would be inquiry going back and looking at the old books, but during prohibition, was prostitution used as a lure to get uh, people to come in to? to um, it could have been, but I don't, I, I don't recall any any uh, tendency in that direction. Uh, it didn't need to. The alcohol itself was a word. Well, I think in Mexico, where that's a common practice. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I didn't see. I didn't see that. Eureka was an interesting port. In, in 19, oh, I forget the year now. 19 mid 50, 1955, 56. A, a guy, a guy wrote an article about Jackson, California, mm -hmm. and it basically said. Last two houses in California were closed up in Jackson. That's where Well, we're behind the Redwood Curtain up here, I guess, because uh, you know he could have wrote a hell of a story about the 19 that we closed up here. Any other questions? Thank you, Bell. Now and. Thank you, Chief Hartman.